Arts is one of them. If you're interested in attending any of the other accessibility webinars, please feel free to look at the Open Library events page where these are available. There will also be a recording of this session available afterwards, and Mark and Ashley are graciously making a OER that will be available as a companion resource in the future to the content from this session. Before I begin the session, I'd like to take a moment to share an land acknowledgement with you. The offices of eCampus Ontario are located in downtown Toronto and are within the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I am joining the session today from Sudbury, which is on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe people of Turtle Island, the Atikamishang, and the Anishawabek. And I would also like to recognize the Wanapate First Nation and the Métis Nation of Ontario. Mary has shared some land acknowledgement information in the chat as well, and please feel free to take a moment and share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. Thank you. Uh, I'm now happy to say that I'm going to pass the presentation over to Mark and Ashley, and I'll give Mark a moment just to share the screen. And just give me one moment here. Can you let me know if you can see this? The screen? Hey, Mark. It's Laura. I can see the screen. Okay, great. And let's get it started here. So our presentation is titled Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and Higher Education, Lessons from a Blind Grad Student and a Sighted Librarian's Journey. My name is Mark, I'm a librarian at Wolf of Laurier University. My pronouns are he and him. Um, and maybe just before we transition, Ashley was going to um, mention yep. the... Yep, thanks. Yep, I'll just step in here with a disclaimer. My name is Ashley Shaw. Um, and the views expressed in this presentation are the views of ourselves, Mark Weiler and Ashley Shaw, and do not necessarily reflect those of the province of Ontario or Ontario Online Learning Consortium. So thank you for that. Our slides are going to have some accessibility features. You're going to hear a little click. I just indicates a slide transition is happening. Text on the screen is really just echoing parts of what we are saying and function to hold visual attention and substantial images will be described. Um, this time of year, as the sun rises, I listen to the morning, uh, listen to morning has broken by Yusuf or Cat Stevens, and I reflect on creation, sharing a moment with Mother Earth. The song magically fits with the sights of the morning trees, birds, the dogs, and their walkers, and asks me, how am I being grateful for the gifts of creation? As speakers, we are from, we are from lines of settlers residing on traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. The places we call home, Kitchener and Waterloo, are on the land of this part of the Haldeman Proclamation, signed between the Allied, British, and Six Nations. Local elders, such as Darren Thomas from Laurier University and Christina Restool from Conestoga College, which hosted its 14th annual traditional powwow last Saturday, share with our communities lessons about being respectful neighbors, being in relationship with the land. Okay, so um, throughout this session, we're going to use kind of a narrative arc to frame uh, the content for you. And this will be through the story of a blind child somewhere in Ontario. And as this child starts to learn Braille, uh, they access Braille resources from the Six Nations Public Library, which is the oldest First Nations public library and one of 20 public libraries in Canada who participate in the National Network for Equitable Library Services distributed Braille collection. And so this child is learning Braille and is receiving books through this wonderful resource. And one of the books that they read is, I want to be an astronaut. And this gets them thinking about um, whether being an astronaut is something that they would like to have as a goal. So, 
Um, all right, so uh, we'll be your guides for this journey today. My name is Ashley Shaw, and I'm a master's student in community psychology at Wilfrid Laurier University. And I study efforts to improve employment outcomes for people who are blind and partially sighted, as well as inclusive workplaces. I'm also the clinical performance and evaluation analyst at Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada. And a few years ago, I had the opportunity to work as a library web accessibility advisor for Laurier University. Um, I've been a screen reader user for over 20 years and a braille user for over 30 years. Um, and so I bring those experiences today. And I'm the web user experience librarian at Laurier University. I also have responsibilities for the psychology department and user, dis user experience design program. I'm a certified web accessibility specialist and also certified with JAWS the screen reader. Um, but our paths have overlapped. Now, initially, the Laurier Library asked for user feedback on a new library platform called Omni, and Ashley reported a problem and met with the library. Now, with the JAWS knowledge I had at the time, I could kind of follow along, but I was really struggling. So I began to practice on a regular basis and hired a teacher, Merid Retta, who was known in the blind Ethiopian diaspora as a technology wizard. And at one point, Merid challenged me to learn JAWS without, my, without sight. And in the depths of my struggles, I thought, oh, I, I can't do that. That's too hard. But after my skills and knowledge grew, I would eventually take him up on his challenge. And it's amazing what's possible when someone believes in you. Later, Ashley returned to Laurier as a master's student in psychology, and she reached out to me about library research. And this drew my attention to more obstacles. By my records, I've reported about 675 accessibility issues in the university and library landscapes. Um, and um, then later on, the Laurier Library found funds for a library web accessibility advisor role, and we hired Ashley. And with Ashley as part of the library, we co-designed things such as the PDF pit stop, the open menu, and what goes on in the library pages. So we're going to take you through a little bit about uh, what a screen reader is and how it works. So screen readers turn digital text into synthesized speech or braille that can be read using a refreshable braille display. They also let users navigate uh, web and software interfaces using the keyboard, even in situations where sighted people would normally use a mouse. The screen reading so software mediates between the mainstream application and the user. And so because of this, uh, users might go about tasks in a slightly different way, or the screen reader might manipulate output um, so that it can properly convey content through non-visual means. Uh, different screen readers work with different operating systems. So in Windows, we have Narrator, which is the built-in screen reader on Windows-based devices. We also have uh, Job Access with Speech, which is the JAWS for Windows screen reader that you'll hear more about today, and NVDA, which is Non-Visual Desktop Access uh, for Windows. If someone is using a Mac, they're using the VoiceOver screen reader, which is Apple's built-in product. And on mobile devices, there are various features built in for accessibility as well. And this is important to note just because um, it can sometimes, the, the screen readers might require different uh, commands in order to use them, and they might represent the content for the user in slightly different ways. So it's a good thing to be aware that people are using these different products. In our demonstrations today, we'll be using the JAWS screen reader. Um, because this is predominantly used uh, in education and workplace institutions here. And we can move to okay. the myths. next slide, I think. So this is myths. So the myths, yes. Yes. Yeah, so you see where I'm <laughs> just keeping track. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So. Um, there's uh, some, some common myths about screen readers and just uh, computer use among the blind that we'll go through. The first is that blind people don't use computers and someone will be helping them. Uh, and this is, uh, this is quite untrue. There are lots and lots of blind people who use computers. And as long as we have the assistive technologies we need and the content and interfaces that we're interacting with have been properly optimized for accessibility, um, we can use computers quite effectively. The next myth is kind of the opposite myth, which is just that all you need is a copy of JAWS or a screen reader and everything will be perfectly fine. Um, and so in fact, web content and software creators have to do some work to uh, optimize their, their products and their, their output for accessibility so that the assistive technologies can cooperate uh, and interact with it. 
this is part of the bargain if you're involved in creating uh, digital content. Uh, another myth is that everyone who uses a screen reader is a super user. So in fact, people's skills, of course, vary and people's opportunities to access training can be unfairly distributed. Some people may have only recently uh, begun losing their sight and their non-visual skills are still something that they're working on. Another myth is that screen readers uh, have replaced Braille. In fact, Braille is an essential literacy skill. And so some of the examples of where it is required are to support spelling and grammar skills, um, to support with mathematical and science notation and learning to write and read in foreign languages. Um, and so the screen reader is an ally or a support for Braille, not a replacement. So myth five is that screen readers read the screen. Uh, but if we share our screen like we are on Zoom, it doesn't mean another person can access it with a, the, the content with a through screen reader. The reality is that the application's interface is kind of represented as a data structure that is stored in the computer's main memory, and JAWS is interacting with that. Uh, myth six is that sc uh, screen reader is overwhelming, but I I think it's a good way to think about it. I think a good way to think about it is it's like playing the piano. With some theory and practice, it becomes easier. And it's uh, um, really important to say that it becomes a really fun experience uh, when the content is built well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how people who are blind learn to use screen readers. Uh, usually the software comes with user guides and tutorials that are either text-based or audio-based. And for the audio-based um, tutorials in particular, usually there will be um, a trainer verbally guiding uh, the user through tasks and the speech output, output from the screen reader is also uh, contained so that the person can listen. And this would be kind of the closest similarity would be, you know, if you're using a video and there's screenshots to show you what different steps, this would be the equivalent for that. Uh, new users can work through this kind of content themselves, or they might be supported by specialized assistive technology trainers. And sometimes that's just a choice through learning preferences. Sometimes um, it's not a choice and folks would like access to a trainer, but they don't have one for whatever reason. They don't have access where they are. And experiences in proficiency with screen readers are impacted by a number of social determinants, like your education uh, experiences and your economic experiences, your attitudes and the attitudes of those around you. It can also be impacted by the age of onset of your disability and how kind of how new you are to um, to to work working with non visual information. Um, how much vision you still have remaining. So there are lots of people who use screen readers in combination with magnification. Um, and then gradually, as their vision deteriorates, they need to learn more screen reader features. And the presence of additional disabilities might mean that um, alternative learning supports are required to really make someone, uh, help someone become proficient with a screen reader. Is that to me, Ashley, now? Uh, yep, go ahead, sorry. Okay, great. Um, for me, the experience was that the learning environment was not what I was accustomed to. I was confused, frustrated, and discouraged. But in response, I adapted my learning environment, like adding textures onto my keyboard. And to develop conceptual knowledge, I actually had to read technical material, not intended for learning screen readers, but it provided me some conceptual knowledge that was important. And I also got help from the blind community. So for example, I, as mentioned, I was introduced to Merid Retta through a member of the Waterloo Regional Chapter of the Canadian Council of the Blind. And it was also extremely helpful to have role models like Merid or Ashley to help me what was imagined to help me imagine what's possible with non-visual skills. I think a mistake I made came from being so strongly bound to the visual interface. It took me a long time to recognize that there's a sibling interface, the oral interface, which is a, is what a screen reader constructs with sound. Key point that I take is that learning required being creative, resilient, and asking for help from experts in the blind community. And the goal is to develop, to develop non-visual skills and conceptual knowledge about the oral interface rather than the visual interface. So let's uh, jump back to the story of our student for a second. So they're in high school now and they're learning their assistive technology skills and they're taking their science classes and really enjoying them at their supportive school. And they found the Canadian Space Agency's website as they continue with their quest to learn more about what it would take to become an astronaut. Um, and 
we're going to use a Canadian Space Agency page to just briefly demonstrate some JAWS capabilities. Okay, here I go. Yeah. That's cool. More options. Jeremy Han. All right, so I'm just going to briefly go over um, some of the capabilities of the JAWS screen reader when navigating a web page. Um, so there are different kind of levels. You can navigate the page at kind of a really high level or in, in large jumps, um, all the way down to, you know, minute navigation through text using your using your arrow keys. Um, and so um, one way that people will navigate on a web page um, is just to use the tab key. Navigation region, list, with three items. Skip to main content, same page link. Skip to about government, same page link. Uh, and this will take you through any elements that, I like to think of them as any elements that can be activated. So links, buttons, form fields, those kinds of things. Just static areas of text are not going to be accessible. The tab navigation is just going to jump right over them. Um, so users need to figure out when to use the arrow keys um, to navigate through you know, chunks of text and, and when it's best to use the tab key. Um, another thing that you can do is to navigate by regions. Banner. And if you're not sure what a region is because it has a title that's not particularly helpful, um, you can just arrow down. Heading level two language selection. Search region. That one's more uh, self-explanatory. Navigation region. Heading level two menu Canada dot Navigation region. Heading level two you are here. Main region. Heading level one Jeremy Hansen's mission path. And so the main region of the page is usually where the kind of front and center content is located. Another tip that you can use, I'll just go back to the top of the screen. Jeremy Hansen's mission patch. Is just to press the number one in the, in the number row. Jeremy Hansen's mission patch, recognizing indigenous people's head. To move to the heading one, which is in most pages kind of styled for the title of the main content uh, of the page. Um, and you can navigate using um, other numbers for other heading levels or just, you know, the letter H to, to move between headings. You can also locate, if you know something is a button or a checkbox or an edit field or things like that, you can navigate by those elements. Um, so I can navigate through buttons. All show images and videos button. Images show images only button. Videos show videos only toggle button pressed. The other thing that you can do and the last thing we'll go through in this uh, segment is you can generate with the screen reader dialogues or list views of just the specific elements that you would like to see. So this is a links list view. JAWS version 2024, J. Aramy 10 of 53. Um, and so this is uh, taking you to um, it, the link that's the closest to the uh, location on the page where, where you, you were pre previously navigating. Um, but, you know, it can be an easier way for some people to uh, to navigate through pages. Um, and it's one of the reasons that uh, people are advised, content creators are advised not to use text like click here uh, to identify a link. We want the links to have descriptive titles of their own in case someone's navigating through a page in this way. You can also just, uh, instead of activating the link through this list view, you can move directly to that place on the page. Move to link button, enter, visited link to Jeremy. And it also reports, of course, which links you've already visited and which links um, uh, by, by indicating that they're visited. Um, so you can tell them apart from links that you haven't visited yet. Jaws home screen sharing meeting can all more options. Jeremy Han. All right. So what I'm going to describe here just as a bit of an orientation is this idea of the oral interface. And it was something that took me a while to really recognize. So on the left of this page uh, is is the visual web sorry, on the left of the slide is the visual web page that we just saw from Canadian Space Agency. And on the right is a visualization of the oral interface. And it's constructed by going to the top of the page and then pressing the down key. Um, and then each utterance in JAWS is broken down into a row and a table. The first column is the line. We didn't hear line numbers, um, but the second um, column is the control, what's called a control type. Is it a button? Is it a link? Is it a heading? And then the third column is the label of that control type. And then I used color schemes to indicate if items are parts of a region, so, so to relate them semantically. Now, Anger Walter from the from Germany made a draw script for me that makes it easy for me to create this type of map. I found that very helpful 
um, in uh, recognizing um, that there's this oral interface. The image also sh uh, shows that we can see how parts of the visual interface correspond to the parts of the oral interface, such as the heading level one, the play button, and the description tab. Now, notice how the, the oral interface is like a linear structure. Um, because of this linear structure, this is why we don't give instruct we shouldn't be giving instructions like click the bottom and the top right corner, because in a linear structure, there are no corners. Uh, it's better to include the label in those instructions, like click the button in the right corner labeled submit. Uh, we're now going to shift to the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, the, these guidelines are usability guidelines and that they emphasize how to build computer content so it's usable for people with disabilities. Now, the guidelines are meant to be agnostic to technology, so they can apply to HTML, to PDF, and, and so on. And it has four layers, with the upper layer being the most abstract and the lowest layers being more con concrete. So for layer one, the top layer um, are the four principles of usability. For digital content to be usable by anyone, the content has to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust enough to work with a variety of technologies. Uh, the second layer, the guidelines, um, is states that for each principle, there are a number of guidelines that make that principle a reality. For example, guideline 1.3 uh, is about adaptability, and it says that content should be presentable, presented in different ways without losing information, such as if it's on a large monitor, you should be able to adapt it to a small mobile phone. But again, at this stage, the guidelines are still abstract. Uh, layer three is about success criteria. For each guideline, there are success criteria which need to be met to achieve the purpose of the guidelines. So for example, guideline 1.3 has three success criteria, 1.3.1, 1.3.2, 1.3.3. 1 and success criteria 1.3.1, info and relationship, says that, quote, information structures and relationships conveyed through presentation can be programmatically determined or are available in text. Now we're getting more specific at this layer. And so these success criteria are designed to be testable. And if a test for a success criteria fails, then the guideline isn't being followed. And this is our reminder to include a, a, a feature that some people may need. So the WCAG uh, guidelines are providing us with, with, with reminders about what to include in our web content to make it usable by people with disabilities. Uh, layer four is the most concrete layer. The authors of the WCAG publish specific authoring or coding techniques known to meet the success criteria. And they also produce tests to determine if a success criteria was broken. But these techniques and te tests aren't exhaustive. It's like a young person moving out of a family home. They may be given some tried and true family recipes for making healthy meals, but those aren't all the recipes uh, for making uh, healthy meals. The young person has to add new re recipes to their book. Uh, but now we're going to talk about the limits of the web content accessibility guidelines. So first of all, uh, WCAG or WCAG, as we sometimes call it, it doesn't tell us what content uh, disabled people might need in particular. And so we need to be asking ourselves and our users uh, what content beyond what we're providing might users with disabilities need? And uh, Mark's going to show us a really good example of this. Uh, so this is in a slide of an example of a project Ashley was involved in as the Library Web Accessibility Advisor. She explained to us that blind people may, may not know what uh, why they should bother coming into the library. So she advised us to describe what goes on in the library and how to access it. So this page shows a series of images and descriptions for entering the library, coming up the ramp, then approaching the doors, assessing the inner, accessing the inner doors, and going through the gates. Now, each image, image has alt text. Uh, we have this for each floor of the library. Now, the image are, are for sighted groups, such as a sighted orientational mobility specialist, or sighted family members, 
And it's also to support any person with a disability who wants to know if the library has a feature they need. Now, the WebCake Content Accessibility Guidelines didn't tell us to produce this page. It was Ash having Ashley on the team that drew our attention to it. Uh, I'm now going to talk about a second limitation, and that's that WCAG doesn't address all problems. The fourth sentence of WCAG's introduction says, quote, all these guidelines, although these guidelines cover a wide range of issues, they are not able to address the needs of people with all types, degrees, and combinations of disabilities, end quote. And this is why we see the guidelines getting updated. WCAG 2.0 was published in 2008. Then WCAG 2.1 was published in September 2018, addressing more obstacles. And WCAG 2.2 was published in October 2023. So obstacles can exist beyond the boundaries of WCAG. The next limitation is really that um, sometimes people will say that, you know, we've we've met WCAG, therefore we've, you know, that means it's accessible by in, in and of itself. And we need to remember that the WCAG are guidelines in support of a larger purpose of making content accessible. So they're very helpful, but they're not a standard. Higher standards include uh, provincial and federal legislation, which do sometimes use the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines as a tool. Ultimately, our standard is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which calls us to respond to disadvantage because access is a human right. No, next slide. Um, so let's think about our student again. So they're getting ready to attend university and there are pro programs to support their transition to post-secondary education, like the SCORE program offered by the CNIB. Uh, but the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, of course, don't address all their web accessibility needs. There can be quite a bit of extraneous cognitive load involved engaging in engaging with learning materials that have some accessibility barriers. And so we're going to demonstrate that um, a little bit more in a second. And in this next demo, notice how the video player is right front and center for sighted users. But from a screen reader user's perspective, it's the heading one, uh, the page title that's always uh, front and center. And so this makes important content, in, in this case about the uh, the mission patch that's that's been developed, difficult to find. Here we go. ZP, Jeremy Hansen's mission path. So we're back on our Canadian Space Agency uh, demo page. Um, and we just want to talk about um, a few uh, elements that, you know, might make navigation a little bit difficult or things that could be, be addressed to um, make the content more meaningful. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is just move through the buttons that are in the video player. Search, search button. Jeremy Hansen's Mission Patch, Recognizing Indigenous Peoples Button, Play, Jeremy Hansen's Mission Patch, Recognizing Indigenous Peoples Toggle Button, Mute, Jeremy Hansen's Mission Patch, Recognizing Indigenous Peoples Left Right Slider, 100, Progress Bar. So what you can observe is that the screen reader is being a little bit too verbose. Instead of just telling you as you move around what the, what the uh, purpose of the button is, um, it's providing the the content title for for every single element in the video player um, and this is probably not being done on purpose it's probably just some you know some thing that needs to be addressed in the coding um, but it has the result of kind of generating some extraneous cognitive load when there's too much verbosity and it's not especially meaningful you're repeating a lot of words um, it's taking a lot of effort then for the user to focus on what the screen reader is saying and parse out what information they really need to know versus um, just, you know, spending their energy learning from and engaging with the material on the page. And so you want to keep that uh, extraneous load for users as minimal as possible. Um, and I'm going to play a small portion of the video. Jeremy, 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 research, search, Jeremy Hansen's see, mission patch, recognizing indigenous people's button. It's a little bit difficult play for me to, to locate the, <laughs> the play button. Um, okay, so here we go. Space, pause. Uh, the reasoning behind the animals and the representation is, is to keep us connected, to keep us connected to our natural environment. Uh, when I listen to our elders and talk about uh, as Indigenous people, we've never been given an equal opportunity to, to contribute. 
or are seen as, as equals within our own homelands. By saying that though, um, our elders will say we have yet to give our greatest contribution to the world. And part of that to me is what, we, what we're referring to as the seven sacred laws. When you look at the buffalo, that teaching represents respect. That buffalo gave its entire being in order for the people to live. When you respect, you give of yourself, you give of your life to, to, uh, to help, help people. Space. So what I'm going to do now is just navigate down to um, an area where there's a description provided. Jeremy Hansen's Jeremy Progress Bar. Jeremy Hansen's Jeremy Group. Description tab selected. One of three. Which is already uh, selected. And I'm just going to skim down to where the text right. is provided. Dis right. Dis right. Dis trans down. Trans right. Tr Description virtual up to My apologies. Jeremy Hansen's mission 2020. Here from Anishinaab artist Henry Geeman and David Korchin III, leader of the Turtle Lodge in Sagging First Nation, Manitoba, who worked with Jeremy to create a patch that he will wear in space with great humility. Credits. Uh, and apologies for the mispronunciation of um, of names and places. The uh, the English text-to-speech engine is uh, not good at handling other languages. Um, so this is providing some contextual information uh, as you can tell, but I'm fairly sure, um, you know, even though I can't see the screen while the video is playing that, um, it, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of content that's been very well thought out and, and well executed, uh, you know, that's, that's taking place during the video. That's not necessarily being conveyed through the description. Um, in particular, you know, anything that's evocative or is really engrossing and drawing the reader in, um, around, uh, you know what the patch looks like all together how the how the depictions of animals come together uh things along those lines that are really the the you know the meaningful aspects that have been presented visually and are really doing this this uh topic and these events justice um it's just important to consider what other elements we might need to convey to make it equally meaningful and engrossing for other um for other users so you know what animals sound like describing their size, um, you know, information about kind of tactile aspects. These are not typically things that um, that get included when you're only focused on, you know, providing summary information about what's being conveyed visually. Screen sharing meeting can be ZP, Jeremy Hansen's mission. So now we're going to shift to talking about access, other accessibility issues in uh, academics. Yes, so let's uh, check in with our student again. And so at their university, the future astronaut will have to invest a lot of mental energy dealing with systems that weren't designed for them. There can be obstacles to things like enrolling in courses, reading syllabi, searching for and accessing books and journal articles, writing papers, and navigating through complex online learning modules. While learning modules are often designed to be engaging for sighted learners, if they aren't straightforward to use with assistive technologies, then they generate a lot of extra work and lower engagement for blind learners. So you always, of course, want your learner's attention focused on the content and on engaging with the content, not distracted by engaging with the interface. The platform or the interface should be supporting the content and not taking attention away from it. Uh, next slide. So yes. we're now going to shift to a demonstration of a course syllabus. We're going to be looking at headings, tables, and lists. And we can only really touch on this kind of quite briefly, but I hope it gives a bit of idea of how to approach things. I have a fictional syllabus open in Microsoft Word's desktop app. A window shows my hands on the keyboard to give a glimpse of using keyboard commands. Now let's suppose I want to know what are the required readings for the course. Now, in this example, the author just increased the font size on sections like Course Overview. So visually, I can browse the page and find the course readings, but when documents aren't styled with headings, screen reader users have to step through the content line by line or search the document by a keyword and hope that they've guessed right. I'll show you an example of this. So I'm going to press the Down key. And we'll hear it say space travel, contemporary issues. Space travel, contemporary issues, and space travel will be discussed. And I press the down key again. Course readings. 
So from a screen reader's perspective, all we heard was course readings. It's just regular text with no indication that it's a section heading. Space. Speech on demand. But it's easy to add headings to Word in Microsoft Word. You put the cursor on the text and go to the Home tab and then to the Styles area. There might, might be a Styles button on smaller monitors, but that opens up a Styles gallery. And I'm going to pick Heading Level 2 in this case. There's Heading 2. And you'll have the options for Heading 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And the headings you pick should reflect the hierarchical structure of your document with sections and subsections. So I can also use shortcut keys like Control alt 2 to style it automatically. And I can adjust the font attributes if I wanted to make that, uh, say, bold or underline by modifying the style in the style gallery. But now, when I turn on JAWS, on. I can navigate to the content easily. Heading to course overview. Heading to course readings. Space travel contempt. And if I was to step into that, uh, the course reading section, I'd hear its heading level. Heading level two course readings. Space speech on demand. So that's headings. Now for list, we use the button options in the lower ribbon or the numbered list to create uh, our lists. I'm going to turn on the voice of JAWS again. Full speech. I'm going to uh, navigation mode. Nav off. Nav on. Now if I press the L key. Level one. Bullet Dell and Soto left Baron 2018 right Baron. Our I can navigate to lifts. Space 2. Bullet Ash sticker A. Allows bullet W. DS dash more said. Eco 202. Off. Space. Speech on demand. Oh, you only have. You could touch on the basics of tables. Um, but for now, the general advice is to avoid complex tables. And by complex tables, we mean tables like this one I'm showing on my screen, which has merged columns or merged rows. And I'll demonstrate this here. Full speech. So I'm going to step into the table. Table one, not uniform table. New cell leak. I'm going to go to the right to the, the date. Date column three of five. I'm going to press the down key. Foundations, January 10th. So we heard it say foundations, and then January 10th, but we skipped over this merged uh, sp uh, column span here. Now I'm going to step down. Foundations, January 17th. Go, go to the left. Week two. Go to the left again. Beginning of row. Beginning of row. So the screen reader thinks that we're at the beginning of row when there is this themes column still here. Foundations. Now I could get into it by going up one theme. Foundations. and over. So there's some idiosyncrasies in here uh, that make it difficult to, uh, to navigate and possibly miss important information. So the, the advice is to simplify tables and not use merged columns or not, and not use merged um, rows. So here's an example of that. Table two. Foundations. Week two. Theme. Foundations, row week three. Foundations, two, theme, foundations. So we can get into that content. And the other bit of information that was used as a column span could be probably added in, uh, as text in the, the document uh, or in the table somehow. I have a... So we're now going to be talking about other academic issues. Yeah, so these are just uh, a few examples of, um, of some of the issues to be aware of in academic contexts. And the first one is that all students are different. Sounds really obvious, but it, it's easier for us to forget. So people who are blind are not all the same because of course we have different aptitudes, skills, interests, and experiences, just like other students. A current student might require supports that a previous student did not. So comparing a current student to a previous student is unhelpful, and you would be surprised how many times faculty or staff do that even in front of a student. Um, don't do that. <laughs> also, material that's provided to blind students is often not proofread. Um, so there are you know, very uh, advanced proofing processes involved in publication, but when content is remediated for accessibility or, or modified to generate an accessible copy, copy, often no one verifies the material. So ask yourself, who verified that this content is accessible and accurate, and how did they verify it? People have sometimes told us that no students have come forward to them to report a problem with the material, 
but that's not really the student's responsibility. And most students have far too much work to do to, you know, go around telling everyone what it, when, you know, there's spelling mistakes in the accessible copy or words that are blended together or things like that. It's also important to remember that the student might not actually be aware that the copy they're using is different in some way um, from the original copy. So if a table is being depicted wrong, if statistical information is being presented wrong, if a term is spelled incorrectly in the accessible copy, how am I going to know what it looks like in the, you know, in the original copy? Next slide. And I think we're on the next slide. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the other thing to remember is that accessibility is not just about, you know, for, for people who are blind, providing access to visual culture or to able-bodied ways of knowing. It's about recognizing that different situations call for different senses and modalities. So for example, digital content highly privileges the senses of vision and hearing, but other modalities like tactile senses or muscle memory are critical for learning and need to take their place in our education systems. Um, so always remember that you know, the content that we're starting from and then we're coming at the other side to make it accessible um, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only content we should be using. A lesson Ashley taught me is that educators and librarians have a responsibility to support the search for knowledge in all its modalities, whether visual or non-visual. This may not be what we're accustomed to. We may get confused, frustrated, and discouraged. It requires us to be creative, resilient, and to ask for help from the blind community, such as Braille Literacy Canada or the International Network of Researchers with Vision and Impairment and their allies. It requires us to have paid roles for people with disabilities on our teams. And it requires us to recognize the leading library groups known for serving the blind, such as the National Network for Equitable Library Service, the Center for Equitable Library Access, the Andrew High School Braille and Talking Book Library in New York, and the Six Nations Public Library, the library that invited our young astronaut in Braille to dream of being amongst the stars. In collaboration with blind communities and these library groups, we can do amazing things. So let's reach for the stars. So what did happen to our student? Well, they became an astronaut through much motivation, hard work and supports, and off they launched on their first space mission. They felt gratitude for all the advocates and allies who came before them, for the Six Nations Library for participating in a Braille program, and for websites like the Canadian Space Agency for continuously working to engage in web accessibility efforts. And we'll just go to the next slide, I think, okay. um, uh, for the um, sonification, which I'll just kind of briefly introduce. So those who are first, cited, first oh, or... <laughs> sorry? Do you want me to play it for, or do you, we I'll really just introduce it briefly um, and, and, and then we'll play it for you. This is just our kind of uh, treat for you before we go to questions, yeah. um, because those who are cited uh, analyze data by generating images, but uh, those of us who are blind access some types of data through sonification, which is generating the data into sound instead of into an image. Analyzing images leads to important insights and discoveries, but analyzing sound leads to others. And so this example is from the uh, Pillars of Creation found in the Eagle Nebula, and it's a sonification from NASA. And I guess this slide will introduce it to you as well. We just have some sources to acknowledge, and I think that leaves us with questions. Hmm. Ashley, it's Laura. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I would invite anybody who has questions to please feel free to drop them in the chat, or you can unmute yourself. Uh, Mary, if you're able to stop the recording at this point.